Welcome to Technovation. I'm your host, Peter High. My guest today is Dame Stephanie Shirley. Dame Stephanie is a pioneer in the British technology landscape. She joined the post office research station in the 1950s, becoming a programmer under the legendary Tommy Flowers, who helped develop Colossus, the first programmable electronic computer which helped decrypt codes on D-Day. In 1962, at the age of 29, she founded a technology company called Freelance Programmers, which would grow to be a nearly $3 billion company with 8,500 staff at the time of its acquisition by Sopra Steria in 2007. She also refers to herself as a venture philanthropist, as someone who has founded and driven charitable foundations focused on autism, as well as technology. I also look forward to hearing more about her memoir, Let It Go, My Extraordinary Story. Dame Stephanie has indeed lived an extraordinary life and continues to work at the age of 88. Dame Stephanie, welcome to Technovation. It is an honor to speak with you today. Lovely to be here. Well, Dame Stephanie, I, I'm, it's been really fascinating for me to get to know your story over the past couple of years uh, in reading a variety of articles uh, about you and this remarkable uh, life and career that you have had. And I'm looking forward to covering it all through this conversation, or at least a, a good slice of it. Um, it's a long and- life. It's a long <laughs> life. Have we got enough time? <laughs> well, I, I would love to uh, talk a bit about your childhood, because I know that in many ways uh, it was, at what, like for many of us, uh, it, it was um, an important aspect of what uh, what you became uh, and the remarkable um, risk tolerance that you had in eventually becoming an entrepreneur and getting involved in what you like to refer to as venture philanthropy and, and, and a variety of other things, each of which we will cover. But um, you, you uh, grew up in a German Jewish family in Austria and uh, at the age of five were sent to the UK without your parents uh, and grew up in the UK in the, in the West Midlands uh, with, with, a, with, with a, an adopted family. Talk a bit about that experience and the extent to which that became a, a, a shaping, um, a shaper of your future in many ways, um, if you wouldn't mind. Well, I believe we're all the sort of product of the significant things that happened in our childhood. And that massive transition from um, a fairly stable Jewish family or part Jewish family um, in on the continent of Europe uh, to a new country, new language, new nationality, new everything really, has made an enormous difference to my life. It's made me um, able to deal with change because nothing is as significant um, as that change was at the age of five. You know, it just seemed as if my world stopped and another world started again. I sometimes give my date of birth as as the day I arrived in England. Um, which is a Freudian slip, but, you know, that's that's how I feel. Life started again. But after that, change doesn't, doesn't scare me. And in the digital world in which I work uh, and have spent my life in, in computers and mathematics, it's very useful to be able to deal with, with change because everything is moving so rapidly. The other thing that happened to me though, as a child was that well-meaning adults Uh, said to me, um, five, six, seven years old, aren't you lucky to be saved? Aren't you lucky to be saved? And indeed, I was lucky to um, get out from the Holocaust. But that gave me a a sort of somewhat unhealthy uh, need to justify why I was saved. And so I don't fritter my life away. Not only is it a long one, but it's been a very full one because I feel that I need to justify my existence, and that's not particularly healthy. Mm. Um, And the other thing, I suppose, is that dates from those days is that um, I really am a patriot. I I love England, my adopted country, um, with a passion that perhaps only someone who has changed countries, lost their human rights, can feel uh, It's such a dramatic thing. Um, Today, of course, with the problems in the Ukraine, uh, we're hearing about um, refugees arriving with or without their families, mainly women and children. And it brings a lot of the horrors of um, the refugee situation uh, back home to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I can only imagine that must be the case, Dame Stephanie. I I would love to also ask you, um, the immigrant's journey is itself... uh, 
fundamentally entrepreneurial in some ways. Um, uh, it, your, your, your immigrant's journey was not one of choice of your own, at least as a five-year-old, but those who require, as you did, you, you, in your case, you had new parents, even a uh, new nationality, a new language. Um, you, th th there were aspects of what you were learning that uh, I have to imagine, and you alluded to it, in fact, uh, were giving you uh, a sense of resilience, I would imagine, that's necessary in, in, in uh, as the risk taking that's, that, that an entrepreneur must have as well. Is that, is that a fair assessment? I I, I didn't use the word resilience until much, much later, and I learned it in business. Um, mm. But I, I call myself a survivor. I was conscious that I'm a survivor. Yeah, I can, I can only imagine that must be the case. Well, in, in the 1950s, you joined the uh, post office research station. Uh, and it, it turns out for, for those, uh, especially in this audience, who may be uh, less familiar with that, that was a fortuitous place to begin one's career. You, you uh, worked with Tommy Flowers, who had developed Colossus, uh, the first programmable electronic computer, uh, which helped uh, decrypt codes on D-Day. Uh, and despite the fact as you, 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 uh, uh, that you did not have a formal university uh, training, you had uh, very strong mathematics skills. And this was where you had your first uh, exposure to computers. Uh, talk a bit about that, that phase of your career, if you would, and the, the, uh, the importance of it for you. Well, I always wanted to be a the world's greatest mathematician. It was soon very obvious that that wasn't going to happen. But I was lucky because the computer industry came along. And in the early days, you did actually need mathematics to work on computers. So I was equally lucky to work in Tommy Flowers' division. He was an inspirational manager. Um, if ever I had a mentor, I would think Tommy Flowers was the nearest, though it was only a you know, good morning, Mr. Flowers. I was very, very junior and he was very, very senior, but a very nice man who listened to all his staff. And, and I had by that time or got pretty tired of being patronized and uh, as a woman. And um, he never did. He had the same manner, very gentlemanly manner. Um, to everybody that he dealt with. So it was a very happy period when I worked with him on the first electronic telephone exchange in Britain. That was at a place called High Woods. Um, I worked with him on um, the first and third transatlantic telephone cable. Can't remember much of that, but it was masses and masses of calculations, which uh, uh, was my joy to do. But the really, the one exciting thing that everybody remembers for me is um, that I worked on the premium bond computer, the lottery computer called Ernie, standing for Electronic Random Number Indicator Equipment. And that was the premium bonds were, were set up post-war um, to encourage people to save in small quantities it was in you know one dollar, five dollars, this sort of sums of money. I had the responsibility with a colleague uh, of checking and to a certain extent guaranteeing the randomness of um, the numbers that were used in the lottery. And I reported to uh, Parliament every month uh, on, on that. So it was for the first time I've had sort of, you know, what was an obviously national importance that I had to report to Parliament. Uh, it was a very interesting time. And I, I, I learned a lot, as one always does when you're 18, 19, 20. Um, I did get my degree uh, at, at evening classes. Um, so I, I did begin to feel like a real mathematician. Uh, but what I worked on really was computing. I, I can only assume this was highly unusual, a woman in your, your role. Um, what, what did it feel like to be uh, such an outlier? And, and what, what uh, gave you the fortitude at a time when this would have seemed so unusual? Oh, I mean, it was horrible. Um, you walk into a canteen and, and, you know, 200 men's heads turn around at, the, at a woman coming in to join them. Um, it's not easy being the first woman or, or the first anything, really. Um, I quite like to be first. Um, I like to be the first to do something, the first to think about something. Um, and I'm always very pleased with myself when occasionally that happens. But most of the time, of course, we're building on other people. And I had excellent colleagues. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, indeed. And, and uh, you've uh, spoken at length on many occasions about the power of startups and uh, the, the fact that it's an exciting thing to take one's own idea and, and see it through to fruition. And indeed, at the age of 29, you started your own company. Um, and, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the, the impetus for that. What inspired you, again, at a time when this would have been so unusual for, for a woman, a, a young woman at that, uh, to, to start her own company, uh, freelance programmers. Talk, talk a bit about that, the early stages, what, what kind of inspired you to, to, uh, to embark on that journey? I was really driven, not by any desire to make money, though um, I did eventually make serious money, um, but I was driven by the sexism that I had met in the workplace and was fed up with it and determined to set up my own organization that was the sort of organization that I wanted to work with and lots of other women would also, the characteristics, extreme flexibility, um, flexibility in, in timing, flexibility of where and as well as when you worked. Um, and it was a crusade, it was a social business. I measured success in terms of the number of women that we employed. It was very much part of that democratization of women, because up to then, women were disbarred from certain activities and mainly financial activities so that uh, we couldn't, uh, I couldn't even open the company's bank account without my husband's authorization. That made me very cross. Um, and he was uh, a lovely man and um, he, he was very nice, <laughs> nice about it. But it, 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 it just seemed so ridiculous. I heard the other day that in the States, uh, women were disbarred from having credit cards until about the 1970s. I mean, th these things are, seem like um, out of another era, but this it's only one lifetime back. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's a very well said. And I can only imagine uh, the, the inspiration you were to the women you were hiring. Many of the first 300 were in fact women. Um, but of course, there, there were... Uh, the companies you served, large, massive global organizations, uh, was there difficulty in convincing some of those early clients that this was a serious business when, in fact, most uh, companies they would have been used to, presumably, doing business win with were run by men? Well, I dissembled to a certain extent and wrote letters, and we wrote letters in those days. It was before the days of email. Um, signing my letters as Steve Shirley rather than the double feminine of Stephanie Shirley. Shirley's being my marital name, of course. Um, and Steve Shirley at least got through the door and was able to pitch for business. And I did think, I think I did have a good story to tell. Um, and I did begin to get some business and we lived really on repeat business. Uh, if we got a new um, customer, we knew that we were probably going to be working with them in, in 10 years' time because we were highly professional. We were doubly sensitive that we should, should never be found wanting that people would sort of say, oh, look, this woman's company can't, can't do professional work. Um, so it was high quality. And um, I was learning about the business in a very entrepreneurial way. If something worked, I'd do more of it. If it didn't work, I'd just try something else. Uh, but it was a slow uh, burn to begin with. Um, 25 years before we paid a dividend, uh, Microsoft took 10 years, I think. Um, but, you know, it was very slow and people remember my successes, but uh, they had a lot of failures as well, especially in the early days. And, and, and only now, really, are many organizations starting to think about um allowing people to work when they wish to have their private life and their personal and their professional lives in, in, mix in some unusual ways as a result of the pandemic, as a result of our, uh, many of us still working from home rather than in offices or more frequently doing so anyway. In the early days, you were a mother, many of the people you hired were mothers. And you uh, allowed for a degree of flexibility that I can only imagine was also very unusual then. Um, uh, is, that, is, that, is that fair to say, Stephanie, Dame Stephanie? Um, it was unusual and also um, stimulating to know that we were special, that we were, were remembered, um, that we were driving a new way of working to integrate work in, into one's personal life. 
I've just written the foreword for a new book that's coming out later this year called Work Styles. And this takes it one degree further. Um, not only is it as, as and when, um, but it's in small units of time, literally being able to do half an hour here and an hour there in different places, complete flexibility. Um, and that it encourages um, people to be professional about their work, um, to separate work from their having a little snack from the fridge. Um, there are disciplines of working from home. Um, I'm conscious that we have started um, a lot of things, including what's called the gig economy, because we paid people uh, on zero hour contracts. We call the min max contracts. Uh, so very, very flexible. And all, all that has, has really come to fruition um, during the pandemic when uh, the technology is there to make it easier. Um, and we really seem to have made some progress that I was talking about 50 years ago, nearly 60. We're just about to celebrate our 60th birthday. It's extraordinary. The company. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's extraordinary. And to think even in the, I believe it was 31 years that you were uh, an active executive in the organization from its founding in 62 to your retirement in 93. Uh, gosh, that, to think about the differences across those decades that you, you started in 1962 when, when computers were in some cases, the size of, you know, massive rooms, you ended on the, uh, at the early, very early stages of the digital age. Uh, and of course, you've remained active uh, in, in, in across a variety of different uh, uh, charities and business uh, ventures since then as well. Talk a bit about the evolution of technology and how you kind of remained current and, and somebody uh, who, who could propel the organization to evolve as the times evolved. Well, my really big secret is that I surround myself with people who are much smarter than I am. Um, and I give them the environment in which they are trusted um, trusted as individuals, trusted as teams, trusted financially. Um, and I'm able to draw out high quality work from an unusual um, and unconventional workforce. If somebody suggested something or if I saw a client using a technique that um, I would think, well, perhaps, perhaps a version of that would work for us. And so we were introducing emails in 1987. We we're doing virtual reality um, in 1998, um, always very much at the front of everything, which mean, meant that although we made mistakes, we were able to stay ahead of much larger organizations who perhaps had to go through uh, more procedures before they introduced a um, even a small capital um, improvement like that. I thoroughly enjoyed business, much to my surprise. I like people. Uh, they don't necessarily like me, but it, it doesn't worry me if they respect me. Um, but I did enjoy working with very bright people. I'm in, in contact with many of them today. Some of them I got to work in my set of charities as well. Mm. Um, I had quite a, um, a, a rich life. Uh, because of the business, I, I went to places. I've been in Saudi Arabia. I've worked in Australia. I've worked in the States. Um, and uh, I was on an American charity as well. Um, so it, it's given me a very full and three-dimensional life that uh, I wouldn't swap for anyone else's. Uh, wonderful. And, and I want to get into your, uh, your charitable uh, work in a moment. I, I do want to just mention... Your organization uh, was listed on the London Stock Exchange in 1996. By 2007, it was valued at nearly $3 billion uh, with yeah. 8,500 staff. Uh, it was acquired in 2007 by a French company called Sopra Steria. But um, so remarkable success. What you created became a colossus. And I can only imagine as a source of great pride to you. I, I did want to. It is a source of great pride, but in a way, um, I'm somewhat disappointed because it finished up much like any other quality corporate. Um, a few more women are in top management, perhaps. Um, but apart from that, it, it became a, 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 a very conventional um, quality corporate um, in, in change management. One of the things that I think um, had made a difference for a long time 
was that I got a quarter of the company into the hands of the staff so that when the success did come, uh, they, they also benefited um, significantly. And um, that's probably the largest gift I ever made, uh, but it didn't look, look like bits of paper. Um, and I'm not sure that it was really valued, but I'm so excited to have been at the forefront of, of co-ownership, uh, which I believe is a way forward for modern businesses where we're more, more interested in, in the brand uh, the, than in necessarily the short-term bottom line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting. And to talk a bit about, I wanna go back to the early part of the, the point you just made, that the company in some ways became a more conventional company. Where are we sort of in the state of the union of women in, in technology and business from your perspective? Where, where, where have gains been made and, and what, what perhaps keeps them from, from happening as rapidly as is appropriate? In a way, all the legal issues that I was addressing are in the past now. Women can do nearly everything um, in the Western world that they want to. So why are they not making more of an impact on middle and top management? The figures in the IT industry is that one in six people are female, um, but in the top management, it's down to one in 10. So they're hardly really noticeable. And so they're making the same sort of impact perhaps that um, the, the black input uh, is making in the States. Uh, people are there, they're noticed, um, but it's not really um, accepted. It's not really a culture that is uh, amenable to women. What do I mean by that? Partly the flexibility, partly the sheer mutual respect that women are still not getting. And of course, it is acutely irritating to be patronized. I always make a joke about you can tell an ambitious woman by they have flat heads. And that really comes from people patting you patronizingly, say, well done, Steve, well done. Um, and um, th that is not an incentive for, to me. It's, it just angers me. Mm. I can only I can certainly understand why. I, I do want to get into your philanthropic work, which has dominated your activities in, the, in recent decades. Um, you've spent an awful lot of time as a what you refer to as a venture philanthropist. Um, I'd be interested before we get into the subjects of of where you have chosen to uh, put your time and your funds. Uh, I'd love to understand your approach because uh, because you well, you do think of it very much as a business person would in terms of analyzing uh, problems that you might help solve. Uh, the, the amount of money to put into it and time, of course. Talk a bit about your approach as a, a private sector executive now in the, uh, in, in the philanthropic world and how you, uh, how you make your determinations. Well, I started off quite simply of trying to work out my mission statement. I don't think I called it that, but that's big. What am I trying to do? Now, all philanthropists are trying to make the world a fairer place, uh, but the world is a big place and and I, I, I need to focus on, on things that I know about and care about. And there are only really two, information technology, my professional discipline, um, and autism, which was my late son's condition. And we started off saying very firmly, uh, I've always been in research, so it's going to be pioneering stuff, never more of the same, no matter how worthy. Uh, so it's pioneering and strategic. So it's not only making a difference in the short term, but making a long term difference to scale. That's how I started. After many years, I stopped the mission referring to information technology because there were lots of people supporting information technology and I was beginning to get out of date. So I stayed um, focused on autism, where I've been a major player for, for, for many years. Strangely, though, just having made that decision, um, I made one of the biggest donations, um, 10 million plus pounds sterling, um, into the Oxford Internet Institute, which again is one of these new things. This was in the year 2000, 2001, it opened. Um, the Oxford Internet Institute focuses um, not on the technology, but on the social, economic, legal, and ethical issues of the internet, much more the social side, just like I started my company 
uh, as a social business that eventually turned into a, a conventional business. Very interesting. And I, I, I talk a bit about the progress made on, on the, the two topics that you are passionate about, autism and, uh, and technology. You've, you referenced the Oxford Internet Institute as an area of, of particular interest. Do you, do you see progress being made as a result of your involvement uh, and your giving in, in those areas? I, I wouldn't like to think it's as a result of mine, the result of many people and certainly of research. I'm a great believer in research in trying to drive a, a, a good future for everybody. What has changed in autism has been quite dramatic. Um, when my son was young, it was considered to be a very rare disorder that affected only boys. Uh, it's now known to affect something like one in um, 50 children um, and boys as well as girls are affected, though boys are, are predominantly so. It was then considered also the product of poor parenting and that made it particularly difficult for autistic families or families with an autistic member um, because um, people were basically saying, not only have you got this difficult child, but it's your fault. And um, they had horrible expressions like refrigerator mothers. Now, I'm a mathematician and you start thinking, well, maths is perhaps not a good background um, for, for maternal um, feelings, but I found maternal love absolutely all-consuming. Today, we know that autism is a brain disorder um, that affects, that is a congenital, it's there at birth, uh, but it only really exhibits itself late, later on at about two, two and a half years, years old. I mean, I used to dream about a cure for autism. We know that that's not possible. If somebody is autistic um, through and through, like they might be uh, diabetic or left-handed or gay. Or... The treatment for autism um, is of acceptance um, and of developing an individual's understanding of the world as it is and the world learning to adapt. I mean, it is pretentious to expect people with autism to uh, adapt to everybody else's way of thinking. Um, we have to learn to understand the autistic way of looking at things and think of it in terms of interventions. How can we teach an autistic child speech? Because many of them don't have speech. It's a very, very wide range, which makes it difficult to, to consider because I know autistic people who've got, you know, double firsts from Yale and Harvard. Um, and I also know many people, like my, my school is full of uh, children who were 40% without speech, 73% um, boys, um, high proportion of them. Let me tell you a little bit about Prowse Court School, which is a school for pupils with autism um, and complex needs. Now, these are children modelled on my Giles, my son Giles, um, who, for whom there was, he was classed as ineducable. Um, and uh, came under the health system rather than the education system. Uh, he was um, he went to some schooling but finished up with me at home, and that was a fair disaster. But the school is set up uh, for children like him. Um, it has nearly 100 pupils aged 5 to 25. It start, used to finish at 19. And then we put a young adult centre on to make sure that we could. The aim is to get pupils into employment, sheltered employment, perhaps modest employment, perhaps part time employment. Um, but it runs a little bakery um, so that people leaving the school have, have an employable skill um, to, to, to offer industry. Um, I'm enormously proud of it. And it has extremely good results with most people going into employment. These are people without speech, profoundly vulnerable. I was inspired for Prior's Court School by a school in Boston um, called the Higashi. Um, and that inspired me, though we've moved on um, and moved away from some of the, those concepts significantly. But it is wonderful when you have the opportunity of, of making a life for a child. It, it, it's you, you see, I, I don't teach at all, but 
Um, you see them when I visit um, develop, stand up straight. I mean, let me tell you a story. I came in one day and I asked the member of staff, what do we feed these children on? I swear Joe has grown four inches since um, I was here last. And she said, no, no, no. When Joe came in, she was crouched and insecure and looking sideways at things. Now she's standing up straight as a full human being. And that gave her the extra four inches. And I'm very conscious that the example of Prowse Court School um, is going worldwide. We've advised people in France, in, in China, in Japan, and, and to a certain extent in the States, though you have this wonderful Higashi School yourselves. What, what ex extraordinary stories and, and uh, remarkable work that you and, and the teams uh, surrounding these organizations are doing. Thank you for sharing that, Dame Stephanie. Um, I wanted to also ask you about your memoir, Let It Go, My Extraordinary Story. T talk a bit about what uh, inspired you to tell the story. There it is. Uh, and uh, talk a bit about um, you know th that process, what you learned through that process as well. I think it's inevitable that I should finish up with a memoir rather than an autobiography. And Let It Go is a memoir. It doesn't say I, I visited... Buckingham Palace on Thursday afternoon and it was raining. It talks about my emotions, about what was going on in my life. The emotions of setting up a business, of struggling through its early days, of the things that really went badly, badly wrong and nearly sent us under, of, of the survival characteristics of the, of the business, of the teams, um, and, and how we slowly made a, a, a transition into a professional company. It's been translated into German, uh, into Spanish. The Spanish version is out now. And it's just being talked about publication in, in Chinese. I don't know which dialect. Mm -hmm. um, but during the lockdown, which was really quite dramatic for everybody, um, I wrote another book, <laughs> um, quite, quite different. Um, that, this is a hardback, beautifully designed. It was shortlisted for some design awards, self-published. And it's a book of some 30 of my speeches that I've given in the last um, 40 years. When I look at them now, I, they're all dated. And I'm quite proud that some of those early dates when I was starting in certain aspects of the computer world are recorded in that way. People don't like to read speeches, but if they do like to read speeches, may I recommend So to Speak. Wonderful. I, I, it's a, uh, appropriate and fitting uh... Uh, collection that that uh, highlights uh, highlights the great work and extraordinary story that is yours. Uh, thank you for for mentioning each of those. Um, I wanted to just you are a a, a a vital person deep into your ninth decade um, who remains very active. Uh, you mentioned that uh, your background sort of uh, keeps you from doing much that is frivolous. Uh, what what do you attribute your both longevity but also your vitality to, Dame Stephanie? Well, my longe longevity is, is good genes, I think. Um, <laughs> uh, but I, I do try to take care of myself. I, I, um, I swim once or twice a week. Um, I hardly drink. I eat sensibly. Um, and I think it behoves everybody, and especially women who very often talk about health issues in, in their, uh, as a reason for their lack of performance, the other thing that keeps me alive is that if in a conversation somebody uses a term that I don't know, I always ask, what does that mean? I don't understand. Um, now, some people look at women who ask questions as if we're ignorant. Um, I think it is that we're just curious. And that curiosity keeps me alive and keep, takes me into new issues so that um, I do occasionally talk about artificial intelligence um, I certainly um, would love to join a, a virtual reality company, um, but um, I think it's a bit late in my life to be serious about that. Well, Dame Stephanie Shirley, it's been a great pleasure to speak with you, to learn a bit more about your remarkable life, your remarkable career, your many contributions uh, to, to uh, topics of, of great interest and passion of yours. Thank you so much for, for taking time with me today. Thank you, Peter, very much for having me.